markets appear to be in the process of forming a top here and not just at the surface level. The sectors are flipping, risk appetite is shifting, breath is contracting, and volatility is certainly expanding. So with this change in tone, let's build a game plan to navigate the coming weeks worth of trade. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for 100k by May, and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got three additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. In terms of structure last week, solid red bodied bar with very minimal upper wick, very minimal lower wick, not much to read into there from a psychological point of view. And of course, the sellers, they certainly have the win. Strong close for the bears at the bottom of the weekly range. So number one, sellers own structure. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, we've printed a lower high as well as a lower low. This is the first week in a very long time where sellers have gone on two for two. The only other time was back here, and that was promptly flipped back in the upward direction in the early stages of 2024. So it doesn't mean something like that can't happen, but it's worth acknowledging that there is some sort of shift taking place here, where there's certainly a slowing of momentum, if not a shift in momentum from up to either sideways to slightly biased downward. But let's not get overwhelmed by sellers going two for two, because we know that the weekly trend is still up. We have lows, higher lows, higher lows, and higher lows can still possibly hold in this area. As we've been discussing for the past couple of episodes, the 503 level right here is really top of mind for that structural higher low, keeping us over the top of the two-week balance range from back here, as well as over the 38.2 Fibonacci from the January pullback to the all-time high. Beautiful confluence with that 38.2. The other confluence comes in if we bring out the anchored view apps on the weekly. You'll notice that this week, it's very likely the anchored view app will meet us there. Once again, 502 to 503 three as a little bit of a zone. So this is the first place that we're really looking for a higher low to form a major higher low to form by drifting into a stronger daily downtrend, right? And this is not the end of the world. So remember that your time frame of execution must match your time frame of analysis. If you're a weekly swing trader, you should be thinking about, okay, what's the opportunity for possible long entries on the retest here if we can spot the setup? If you're a monthly trader and really zooming out in terms of time frames, don't forget that if we do something like this from a Fibonacci point of view, the 38.2 is still confluence with the previous all-time high, right? If I do something like this, this is making a lot of structural sense at 480. So although we're talking about the topping formation, the process of trying to spot a top on something like the smaller time frames, as we'll see in just a moment, I don't think you want to lose sight of the weekly trend and momentum here overall, certainly continuing to be in the upward direction and classifying this as a healthy and normal pullback. Let's take a look at the volume profile, because I also think that there's an interesting insight here, where if we take a look through the lens of this high volume node. Remember last week's episode, we talked about how that high volume node was actually the exact low of the weekly bar. What you'll notice this week is that we actually closed underneath that high volume node. So as of right now, it's actually more fair to say we have more of a chance for overhead supply to continue to weigh on price action in the downward direction, achieving that pullback towards the 502 and 503 zone. So on the weekly time frame chart, just to recap here, we're not losing sight of the overall move that's happened in the upward direction. Is this a reasonable pullback? Is it worth acknowledging that there's a change in tone here? I think the answer is absolutely. The first line in the sand is at 502, 503. Anything deeper than that, we still have our thinking cap on for monthly higher lows near 480. It's very likely that we would drift into a weekly downtrend before we got there. So let's not jump the gun on that. One final reminder is if you're looking for the market to go to hell in a handbasket, don't forget that we need to flip into a weekly downtrend before you're going to get these really strong sell side moves that everybody remembers as painful. We're not there yet. We're still coming from a higher high and we have the opportunity for a higher low. If that changes, of course, we'll only find out after a couple more weeks worth of trade. On the daily time frame chart, let's firstly evaluate this week's expected move. If you're not familiar with this study, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If we're contained by the upper bound, the number's at 521.15, implying an equal high to last week. And if we're contained by the lower bound, the number's at $500.83, implying a lower low. The expected move is a full dollar more than what we experienced last week, directly tying into the increase in volatility. And we'll also see this in the VIX as we move through today's analysis. So the actionable takeaway there is just expanding your trade plans, right? Giving your stops some more breathing room, but also increasing your targets. If we think about what the expected move implies for trend, it's certainly bearish, right? The daily trend has flipped in the downward direction. 
direction. So as of right now, we have highs, lower highs, and then we also have lows. We tried to give the buyers the benefit of the doubt here, staying over 517.25, but technically speaking, it was a lower low. Thursday is irrefutable. That's definitely a lower low. And Friday of this week is also a lower low. So the daily trend is down and we're looking for trend continuation. So how could we gauge whether or not that's likely or unlikely? Let's take a look at market structure. I mean, this week was absolutely insane. The market could not make up its mind, right? Monday, very neutral. Tuesday, huge down downdraft all to be retraced into the close. CPI comes out. We get the gap down. There's zero follow through in the downward direction. Thursday, big move back in the upward direction, closing over 517.25 Friday. Unfortunately, this is the nail in the coffin for the buyers. Friday is the only time where we have closed now underneath the Thursday momentum sell-off day from two weeks ago. So that lower low and that big close, the noteworthy close underneath that low, in my view, would encourage sellers to continue the momentum in the downward direction or have the opportunity for a lower high to reject something around 515.25. Let's think about it through the lens of buyers, right? If you're a stronger buyer trying to look for this as a mild oversold move, then a rebound back up to the all-time highs, ideally after Thursday's bar, you would have wanted an open inside of this range to then print a higher high over the Tuesday high. It simply did not take place. And therefore, I think it's fair to say that the bears are developing a little bit more of an edge. One thing that you're probably recognizing is that we are sitting right at the daily 50 SMA. That's the blue moving average on your screen. 509, though, is an incredibly weak level in terms of structure, right? We have equal lows, equal lows, equal lows. So the auction has ended improperly at this particular level. And I would expect if we get any sort of open underneath 512, so Monday open something like this, any tests or opens underneath this level, I would be looking for follow through in the downward direction to continue to offer another lower low. If there is some sort of rebound, the place that I would want that lower high is 515.25 because that's where the liquidation and rejection came from on the Friday session where we were finally able to see a close underneath the previous Thursday breakdown low. The other thing that you'll start to note here is that the daily chart could certainly be suggesting some sort of head and shoulders on any lower highs that are beneath 517.25. The reason that I'm using that level is because that's where the Thursday bar closed above and where the buyers at least had the opportunity to close out for an equal high. Obviously, that's not the case and progress was made in the downward direction. So daily time frame chart bias is in the downward direction as of right now, sitting on this weak level, looking for follow through into 505, which is also a structurally weak level. The NVIDIA earnings gap is certainly in play this week, as we'll note based on the lower edge of the expected move underneath 503 there's really no structure until 497. And if there is a rebound, there might be a short-term scalp opportunity for a counter trend move that looks like this. If we can get a higher low over 512 to recapture the Wednesday and Thursday lows. But let's get granular now on the hourly chart and see how that actually unfolds. If the buyers are going to make it happen once again, you've got to be over 517.25. So obviously here, the trend is down on the hourly time frame chart with consecutive lower highs. And starting from Monday, we have lows, lows, lower lows, lower lows, and on Friday, lower lows. So trend is down. Of course, that does strike me as a bearish data point. But we really want to understand the interaction between Thursday and Friday. So on Wednesday, that's when we got the really hot CPI print, right? And of course, the market gaps down and it produces this sideways range. Thursday is important because technically we open over the top of the range, do not find support at 515.25 and drill directly down to the bottom end of the range. And of course, with some hindsight, we can clearly see that the buyers picked it up and ripped it back over 517.25. So if we were thinking that the CPI catalyst was like, oh my goodness, the worst is possibly in the rearview mirror now, we've got that out of the way, let's now see if buyers can step up. After Thursday's close, there are two things that could have taken place if buyers were going to actually flip this back in the upward direction. Number one's fairly obvious, just bullish consolidation up and over 517.25 for follow through into the equal high, maybe closing out a weekly hammer, right? That would have been number one. Number two was that a pullback could have offered another higher low and kept us neutral sort of in this zone here, staying over the top of the CPI range from Wednesday at 515.25. Now, clearly, again, with some hindsight here, we can see that 
Friday offered a rejection of that level. So if we ask ourselves, were buyers actually strong here on the move into Thursday's close? The answer is no. It just looked like volatility. It looked like, honestly, a short squeeze. And that was it. There was nothing else from that. Because again, we have to acknowledge that on the gap down from Wednesday with CPI, everybody probably thought, okay, lower is the outcome. The CPI print was a huge miss, right? So that lack of follow through probably has nervous shorts in here squeezing out on Thursday. So to me on Friday, the fact that, you know, now we're back down in range, this is stronger selling, whereas this is weaker buying, right? So it's important to understand the type of participants on each side of the move. You'll also see clearly this consolidation on the lows of Friday, which is noteworthy to me because we actually get retail sales on Monday morning at 830. Anybody who wanted to reduce their exposure over the weekend, in my view, would have closed out shorts and actually caused a bit of a squeeze into Friday's close. It simply didn't take place. So as we think about about that, we could probably make a loose assumption, not guaranteed, but loose assumption that sellers feel a little bit emboldened here. So as we're thinking about how this plays out into the coming week's worth of trade, there's really a couple of outcomes. This obviously is just bearish consolidation for a bear flag on the hourly time frame chart, and we'll look for follow through underneath that 509, as we described on the daily, into 505 and the top of the NVIDIA earnings gap at 503. That's fairly straightforward, just bear flag, right? If we do get a little bit of a counter trend lift, which would look something like this higher low over 512 be my guess to scalp this range but i really would be looking for a lower high to be set on the counter trend here, then honestly, it's double tops, it's head and shoulders up here, it's very simple inverted hammers, we'd be looking for rejections at 515.25 to trade this back in the downward direction equal lows at 509, the door should be open for follow through after a reattempt in short proximity of time. And by the way, this is just illustration, it doesn't have to happen on Friday or near the end of the week, just sort of pointing out how this rotation would take place, right? So counter trend, possibility for a reversal up here, then trading back in the downward direction to the equal low. If the buyers are really going to make something happen. As we have already described on the daily time frame chart, it's got to be some sort of like miraculous consolidation up here over 517.25. And based on the evidence that we've just walked through, just understanding price action, I think that that seems like a lower probability outcome into the coming week's worth of trade. Let's follow through, though, with some intraday anchored view apps. What you'll notice here on this particular spread is that obviously we've closed underneath all of them. But notice the confluence here around that 515.25. So even if there is a counter trend move to get here, I do imagine that these view apps could produce some resistance there. The other thing is to add in the Fibonacci's coming from the Thursday of two weeks ago high to the newest lowest low. And what you'll notice is the 38.2 is loosely confluence. It's not beautiful. Beautiful, but it is here around 515.25. So therefore, even on a counter trend move in the grand scheme of things from point A up here to point B down here, this is technically healthy bear flag consolidation if you were to draw out this as a range as such, right? Obviously, it's not a pretty bear flag, but in terms of location, that's definitely more bearish than bullish. The other thing to point out is that the 61.8 up here is actually not, again, not beautiful confluence, but near that 517.25. What do we know about a 61.8? It's always the line in the sand. If there's going to be a 100% retracement back up towards these all-time highs, which keep in mind, this structure is weak too. Just like 509 is weak, this is also weak up here. If there's going to be a retracement, you probably want to clear that 61.8, which sort of, you know, in encourages our argument or sort of reinforces our argument that we want to recapture 517.25. So on the hourly time frame, I think that we have evidence of stronger sellers stepping up, but let's reinforce that further with a look at the market internals. So here they are, as always, acting as Exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right-hand corner. I think at a first glance, everybody can agree that, of course, this dashboard is bearish. But how bearish is it, and would it suggest follow-through in the downward direction? Well, firstly, let's take a look at Wednesday's volume outflows. They are substantial. Wednesday, of course, we're underneath the trend lower zone, and the cumulative build out of the tick is extremely bearish. Remember that a substantial read down here is negative or positive 5,000. I think we closed out the day closer a negative 7,700, right? So very substantial bearish day on Wednesday, even though the index just sort of went sideways, right? So that brings us into Thursday. And this, I believe, is the icing on the cake to prove that, yeah, it was really just short squeeze in the upward direction here. If you look at the volume flows, they only closed flat. We really didn't see a build in the upward direction. If you look at the advanced decline line, a lot of damage done on that morning route only to close back at the zero mark. Once again, more indicative of short covering, not necessarily stronger buyers at the exchange level all day. 
And that's especially the case here out of the Thursday cumulative build, right? You would have thought with the glaring trend in the upward direction intraday, that is, on Thursday, that the build would have at least closed out positive, and that's certainly not the case. So in my view, it really supports the claim that this was nothing more than weak buyers or short covering from those who didn't get follow through on the Wednesday gap down from CPI. So how do we close out the week? This really speaks for itself. Huge volume outflows, obviously getting into trend lower zone, and again, a huge cumulative build in the downward direction. So putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, I think it's certainly fair to say that there is bearish momentum. And at this point, I would be looking for follow through in the downward direction. Market profile is always exhibit B. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right-hand corner. Let's begin with the value area and point of control. Here, of course, is Wednesday. Here's Thursday. And here is the Friday session. There's a really interesting dance that takes place here, where on Thursday, you can actually see how the point of control is completely outside of the Wednesday range high. So in theory, you would start to think, okay, we've got maybe stronger buyers stepping up, but what did we just reveal based on the market internals? These are not stronger buyers. And if anything, it looks like a short covering rally. So to see the point of control higher makes it actually easier to understand that that acts as overhead supply, allowing people to sell for break even or just wanting to get out of long positions if they were trapped up here and migrate the value area and point of control lower on the Friday session. What you'll notice is that value is completely breakaway to the downside and the point of control is firmly underneath the Wednesday low of day from the CPI balance that had formed. So that's bearish data point number Number one, which is value is accepting lower on Friday, which makes sense using this as overhead supply. The next thing to understand is that in A period, we actually looked into the H period single prints of Thursday. So if I do something that looks like this or came up just shy, even we stayed in the lower distribution. So Thursday is technically a double distribution separated by this string of H period single prints. And on Friday, you can clearly see the rejection underneath and in distribution number two, the lower distribution on the hourly time frame chart. Remember Remember what we said that we needed the buyers to produce if we were looking for follow through in the upward direction, it was a higher low over this level. And clearly with that rejection showing us that the buyers did not want to or were not able to rotate through the thin structure H period does strike me as being a more bearish data point to follow through on. So as we're thinking about whether or not buyers or sellers are in control of this market, the overwhelming data that we've covered so far actually suggests bears are building an edge. Before we move on over to the NASDAQ, I want to remind you one last time that the weekly trend in the S&P 500 is up. So although, yes, the short term data points are suggesting that we can see follow through in the downward direction, let's not lose sight of 505, 503 as a possible area for a weekly higher low. If the data points change to start looking more bullish than bearish as and if we're finding support down here, then I will change my tone in terms of looking for a rebound out of the weekly and how we have to manage that on the daily as we're still in a daily downtrend. If the data points do not shift when and if we approach this level, if they remain bearish, of course, we'll look for the NVIDIA earnings gap to close. And then the threat, of course, on the weekly is a lower high underneath this zone for follow through in the downward direction. This final reminder is reminding you to keep an open mind to this level right here between the battle of the timeframes, daily downtrend versus weekly uptrend. With that acknowledgement, let's move on over to the QQQs on a weekly time frame chart and take a look at what's happening in terms of candle structure and location as we typically do. So in terms of structure last week, bearish inverted hammer, where in the upper wick, the buyers tried to make a stand and clearly the sellers responded back down to the opening print. And of course, through the opening print for range expansion in the downward direction and a fairly weak close at the bottom of the overall range. So structurally, I would argue the sellers have the upper hand here. If we're thinking about location on the bar to bar count, we do have a lower high. However, we also have a higher low, so a bit more neutral in terms of location. And the sellers do not go two for two like they did in the S&P 500. Now is a good time to also just acknowledge that we're sitting inside of a seven week balance range now. And the simpler trades on the weekly time frame chart are probably what we want to focus on. It's not worth getting chopped up in here. And instead, we want to look for breakouts over 448 into blue sky territories or breakdowns underneath 433.75 into the NVIDIA earnings gap. Now, because we have a bearish inverted hammer, let's talk about the downside first. If we even go for a gap fill reversal, which is off of 425.75, and we'll see this on the daily chart in just a second, the issue on the weekly chart then becomes the opportunity for a lower high underneath the bottom of what 
could then be considered overhead supply up here. And if this lower high happens, we're now talking about a weekly downtrend, a weekly trend reversal. It's a bit speculative, and obviously it takes some time to unfold, but that's one possible threat that the bears are looking to engage with in the coming weeks worth of trade. If we break out, obviously you would just want to see either continuation on momentum or a higher low over the top of the range to confirm that breakout and look for follow through in the upward direction. In the grand scheme of things on the monthly time frame chart, we still know that there's a higher low opportunity here around 412. If we bring out the Fibonacci's from the low of October up to the all time high, great confluence with the 38.2 and the top of the balance range from over here. If we zoom out, it's also very closely aligned with the previous all time high. If we zoom a little bit further in, I just want to acknowledge that the Fibonacci's from the low of January to the high sort of in no man's land here. The 38.2 is arbitrarily at 428.13. That's inside of the NVIDIA earnings gap. I would not look to that to act as major support here on the weekly time frame. If we bring out the anchored view apps on the weekly time frame chart, you will also notice if we grab the proper study, what's going on here? Let's try this one here. There we go. This is also in no man's land, the anchored view app here. So maybe it could start to offer if we can stay stuck in the seven week balance range for maybe eight, nine weeks. So two more, maybe it offers confluence of support around the beginning of the NVIDIA earnings gap at 433.75. But as of right now, it's really not that constructive to be using as a potential data point. This one down below certainly is important around that 408 to 412 zone, which we were just referencing. Let's bring on out the volume profile on the weekly time frame chart, because this also strikes me as important to understand. If we get a breakdown into that NVIDIA earnings gap, it's also a failure of the high volume node to hold, making it even more attractive for a possible lower high underneath to change the weekly trend. So we've covered the threat to the downside, but I also want to talk about the upside here. If you're looking at this through the lens of just a bull flag looking for follow through in the upward direction, let's take a quick measured move and just understand what a possible target to the upside could be based on that bull flag. I mean, we're talking about a 100% extension bringing you into 485.47, 485.50. And the interesting sort of overlay I want to provide is the cup and handle. Remember that we never made it to the target of this potential trade. So let's come down from the bottom to the top, to the base of the handle over here. And that's possibly even in front of the bull flag breakout. So if you're really optimistic on this market, if you're thinking about like AI mania wave 3.0 at this point, maybe you could look for these as reach targets. But for now, I would tend to align more so with thinking about the downside, thinking about the opportunity for the weekly trend to possibly reverse, depending on how we interact with that NVIDIA earnings gap, right? So underneath 433 on the weekly time frame chart, 433.75, my apologies, let's be precise, is very dangerous for all of the reasons that we've just discussed. On the daily time frame chart, we'll begin as always with our expected move. The upper bound is at 448, and if we're contained by that zone, it's just equal highs to the top of the seven week balance range. If we're contained by the lower bound, this is where we have some concerns. It's certainly a lower low and a breakdown of the balance range. The number is at 428.59. It's also arbitrarily inside of the Nvidia earnings gap, which as we mentioned is underneath 433.75 and closes at 425.75. In terms of the overall daily trend, I think it's fair to say it's non-existent at this point. And there's really two structural elements that we want to focus on as concrete takeaways on the daily. Number one is that on Friday's breakdown, we actually did not take out the Thursday momentum low of two weeks ago. You can actually see that we're supporting over the daily 50 SMA, which is the blue moving average on your screen. So that would strike me as being somewhat bullish, perhaps not taking out that low in terms of relative strength up against the S&P 500. However, let's think about whether or not the buyers really have something more impressive going on? The answer is no. On Thursday, you'll notice that we have this really strong close up and over this level at 443. 443 is very important because it represents the bottom end of the micro balance where originally the daily bull flag was offered and it failed, right? You can see that we had lower highs underneath, lower highs underneath that was becoming concerning. So on Thursday, when we close above, just like the S&Ps, basically, we would have liked to see the buyer stay over that key structure and then threaten a break in the upward direction. It simply did not take place. And obviously, We've closed on Friday well underneath 443, but also directly back down on the 50 SMA. So based on those two interactions, I would say on the daily chart, be very, very neutral inside of this box right here. I would not maintain any substantial bias or edge inside of that zone. If we can clear and get a higher low over 443 on the daily, we know that the top of the seven week balance range is in force at 447.15. If you want to be precise, that's where the breakout takes place. And if we're underneath 
436.50, we're breaking down underneath the Friday as well as Wednesday CPI low. You could look for lower high and consolidation down here, but I also want to bring to your attention that risk reward is actually more favorable for longs at the bottom end of a balance range. I know it might seem a little bit counterintuitive. However, let's play this one out, right? If we find buyers at the bottom end of this known area of support, my argument would be that we've tested this so many times that the door is bound to open at some point. And we'll get into how we trade that to the downside. However, if we don't actually break underneath 433.75 and we find some sort of support here, you need to at least acknowledge that the risk reward is more favorable in the upward direction. Possible entries based on some sort of reversal pattern down here. Let's just arbitrarily say that this is our entry. Stop goes underneath and targets, I would say, probably on the daily time frame chart, you're looking to navigate back through this choppy zone for at least a reattempt of 443. Now, I would also suggest that you want to be an aggressive profit taker whenever the market's not really trending. It's not worth overstaying your welcome on any particular side of the trade. So identify that the risk reward is actually favorable for upside near the bottom end of the balance. My favorite way to play this type of trade is actually a look below and fail. I want to see some sort of initiation that attracts sellers underneath the level and then a higher low back above that level. My favorite way to see this is actually an inverted head and shoulders. And we'll talk about that on the hourly chart in just a second. But a higher low double bottom works just the same. You have trapped sellers. And if you can spot this higher low right here, that's the best entry, right? Stops get very tight because you can go entry, stop, and then your risk reward is, again, very favorable for that move potentially into that 443, but certainly taking profits and managing expectations at every single important level that we'll see on the hourly chart in just a second. So you're probably saying, okay, you just identified some more bearish outcomes on the weekly chart. How does that unfold? Good question. I would really look for that initiation to stick with a lower high underneath. So instead of higher low back above, 433.75, show me the lower high, confirm that the sellers are doing what they should do. And it's not just going to be a fake out around this level. We can go stops just above entries somewhere in here and targets would be the uh, NVIDIA earnings gap to close at 425.75. Let's get more granular now and see this on the hourly. So just like the daily time frame chart, there's not much sense in terms of talking about an hourly trend in this box. It's clearly choppy. It's clearly volatile. And we have a 100% retracement. So I do think that we can fall back on a little bit more of a bearish edge based on the failure of the buyers after Thursday's constructive close, no higher low being offered over the top of the range at 433, which we've identified as a very key inflection point. So walking forward on the hourly time frame chart, I would like to see this continue to offer bear flag consolidation underneath 438.50, looking for breakdowns here to get to the top of the NVIDIA earnings gap at 433.75. If the buyers are going to respond to this level to keep the charts bearish, it's very, very important that a lower high persists underneath these equal lows at 436.50 because of what it would represent in terms of progress from the sellers underneath the momentum low of the Thursday session from two weeks ago, right? So if you're bearish looking for the NVIDIA earnings gap to close, it's either got to happen directly on momentum, no looking back, or the lower high wants to stay underneath that 436.50 level that we had just described. So that's how the bears get their breakdown. And once again, the NVIDIA earnings gap closes at 425.75. In terms of buyers, if we're looking for that look below and fail, what do we want to see happen? So fine, give us the bear flag, get us to the level in the first place, even offer the lower high and start the breakdown. The buyers start to build an edge when this turns into a fake breakdown. So you have trapped sellers in here. That's that initiation that fails from the sellers. Higher low back over 433.75. And perhaps this builds out as some sort of inverted head and shoulders. Once again, very speculative and we're not there yet. And this is a back pocket situation, considering that as we'll identify, the sellers actually have a little bit more of a momentum edge. We'll quickly throw on the anchored view apps here on the intraday charts. And what you'll notice is that we are underneath all of them, the entire spread. And the spread is actually over this kind of key inflection point at 438.50. So as the week marches on, if we're lower in the earlier stages, I think it's going to be easier for these to drift in the downward direction and over time offer confluence either at 438.50 or even better for the bears would be down here at 436.50 into the end of this week. And this sort of raises the question, what if we don't get bear flag consolidation and a breakdown first? Well, if, you know, if that's the case, if we do something that looks like this, maybe there's the offering of a higher low here and you can participate in that. But I would be very mindful without a test of this gap underneath trapping sellers at the lows. 
I would totally want to manage expectations inside of this choppy range and not look to initiate any solid trades in that zone. You're really not overstaying your welcome and you're aggressively taking profits as you're trying to navigate through this, what literally was a hellscape last week. If the buyers are really going to get something going on, show me that higher low. Really, show me that higher low over 443 and then we'll start talking. As of right now, it seems like lower odds, especially when we took a look, take a look at the market internals. So here you can see aggressive outflows on Wednesday and Friday in, you know, well underneath trend lower zone on Wednesday, getting well underneath on Friday as well. Cumulative builds are bi big in the downward direction as well. So is the bearish momentum there? The argument is certainly yes. And you can also read into the Thursday session as just a momentum move to the upside based on short covering, not necessarily stronger buyers. A little bit better volume inflows, but certainly nowhere near substantial. I mean, look at where that is. That's 400 million in the upside. In terms of the advanced decline line, again, a little bit more positive than the S&Ps, which were neutral, but not not near trend higher zone and the cumulative build yes it flips positive but it no pun intended does not hold the candle next to any of the bearish builds that we saw in this week's worth of trade let's finish up the nasdaq with a look at our market profile a lot of the same commentary however offering the idea that this is now a flush point, right? Notice that your point of control and value area actually did not migrate into the upper distribution on that Thursday session. So once again, do we have stronger buyers up there willing to commit volume and transact? It would seem as though the answer is no. On Friday, you'll notice that we have value area and point of control lower. We have an incredibly poor low, but it would be irresponsible to not also mention that we do also have a poor high. Three TPOs flat across the bottom, two across the top. One of those is in need of repair based on all of the evidence we've covered so far today. Day, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the bottom side first, looking for the bottom end of the balance range to be in force. And lastly, for the broad market indexes, we have IWM, Russell 2000, and the small caps on a weekly time frame chart. What do we see here? We've got to talk, honestly. Candle structure and location is not great. We've got a solid red-bodied bar, very minimal upper and lower wicks. Sellers are in control. If we're thinking about location on the bar-to-bar -bar count, a massive lower high as well as a lower low. Sellers go two for two on the weekly count. And the reason that this is so concerning is because we know here is a weekly breakout level from the overall multi-year weekly balance range, right? So the fact that the Russell is breaking back down underneath this 200-199 zone does not strike me as a warm and fuzzy feeling inside. If we zoom out on this chart, are we rejecting off of a reasonable place? The answer is yes. The bottom end of the overhead supply acted as resistance here is acting as resistance now. And if this entire breakout fails, this is massive downward pressure for the S&P 500. So in the intro, when I said that breath is contracting, I mean, IWM as a proxy for breath in its entirety, as this moves in the downward direction, possibly failing the breakout, that would be a huge red flag to no longer act as a tailwind for the S&P 500. A couple of other charts that capture my attention, XRT retail, right? If we take a look at this, very similar in terms of what it looks like, but look at what's happening here. We've already broken down more firmly into the previous balance range. What about the XBI biotech, right? Already back inside of the previous balance range over here to the downside. So if this is going to start to foreshadow what's possible out of the IWM, I would certainly take this off your radar as being a healthy component of the S&P bullish narrative, at least as of right now. If we can hold up over this level, then great. And yes, I will concede that if we take a closer look here, it's not like we had an Armageddon close underneath. We've closed right on the level. So it's really paramount that on the smaller time frames, we're really starting to look for buyers stepping up and pushing price back in the upward direction. Where we coming from? Technically, it is a higher high on the weekly trend count, and you would have from here lows, maybe higher lows, higher lows happening here. There is an opportunity for a higher low off the top end of the balance range at 199, but the candle structure and again, the location printing that massive lower high and lower low with hot economic data, as we know, Russell and small caps are always going to be more sensitive to that information. I'm not seeing the easy path forward to continue to act as a tailwind, once again, for the S&P 500. Let's move on into a couple of anchored view app looks here for the small caps. They are going to act as potential support in this band as in if we come barreling down to them. But again, the unfortunate part is just that that's still underneath the top end of the balance range over here. So I'm not thrilled about that particular look. If we come in with the Fibonacci's from the low of the move up to the recent high, technically speaking, you could get a 38.2 retracement here and look for something 
constructive back in the upward direction. But once again, what's the issue with both of those ideas? Once you've looked into the balance range, it's very possible and a very real threat that this actually turns into a lower high than offering weekly head and shoulders. Then you get a weekly trend change after that weekly breakdown takes place underneath the low. So those are my concerns out of small caps. And again, referencing back to what happened in XRT and XBI, I'm not holding my breath that the buyers are going to miraculously save the day and push us right back into these equal highs. I just don't really see a path forward for that potentially taking place on the weekly time frame. On the daily time frame chart, as always, let's begin with our expected move. The upper bound is at 203.96 and the lower bound is at 193.42. This does strike me as a bearish weekly expected move because it's the continuation of the existing daily trend with highs, lower highs, lower highs are already being offered, but we also have lows, lower lows, and lower lows into Friday's close. You'll also remember that 199, which we quite literally just spoke of very highly on the weekly time frame chart, is also the neckline of this as a previous double bottom. Now it's offering the exact opposite as the neckline of a double top. So if lower highs are going to persist underneath the gap from CPI, which keep in mind, this is already a sign of staggering relative weakness. The S&Ps as well as the NASDAQ closed the gaps overhead. Small caps certainly did not, and it's offering a lower high rejection underneath the previous flat and equal lows here at 203. There's also a rejection of the daily 50 SMA, right? So you can start to see how small caps might be forecasting. It's not going to be so easy in the S&P, especially if that that NASDAQ also breaks down into the NVIDIA earnings gap. So walking forward on the daily time frame chart, I mean, ideally, there's some sort of recapture of this zone up here that would change my tone to being a little bit more neutral, maybe looking bullish for a hold of the weekly level around 199 and 200. Doesn't look likely based on the candle structure and the week close on the Friday session. And instead, I would start thinking about, okay, either consolidation down here offers up a balance range, which then threatens the bottom and then breaks down on the weekly time frame chart, or straight up continuation into some of these supports then just looks for a lower high underneath 199. So on the daily time frame chart, I would be neutral to bearish in here, definitely bearish underneath 199 looking for that lower high. And if for some reason there's a higher low being offered after the gap close and some over 203, I might change my tone up here, but still very, very cautious based on the fundamental narrative that's being set forth with inflation running way hotter than the expectations or even just the Fed's target at 2%, right? Let's move on down to the hourly time frame chart here and see what else we can learn about the price action when we get granular. So you'll notice that there still is a little bit of a squeeze on that Thursday afternoon session, but it's just not nearly as strong as what we had in the S&Ps and the NASDAQ, leaving that gap unclosed. And of course, on Friday, we close very weak underneath that 199 level. So I don't think that there's much to expand on here out of small caps other than just identifying the danger that this potentially uh, poses for the S&P 500, right? A main component of why we were constructive in the first place of the S&P breakout was because it was happening with IWM and small caps supporting in terms of the broadening nature of the market rally as and if this fades away as a supporting data point, I would have to dial back my tone and rightfully so I would think in the S&P 500. Let's take a look at the Russell internals and you can see all of the same things we've been discussing so far, really weak volume outflows, nothing substantial on the Thursday sort of rally, if you will. Advanced decliner is in trend lower zone on Wednesday and Friday, and you can certainly see the large cumulative builds out of the tick as well. So no big updates on that front. The bears do have the upper edge based on what I can see. And if we take a look at the market profile for the Russell futures, a little bit of progress made on that Thursday session, trying to migrate in the upward direction. What happens on Friday, clearly point of control is completely underneath that Thursday low. It's not entirely underneath the Wednesday low, which is somewhat interesting, but I would still give the bears much more of a benefit of the doubt with still just the inability to close this gap overhead, even as the remainder of the broad market was really taken off on that Thursday session, just no love out of small caps. So reading into that as a little bit of a signal, once again, that the broadening nature here is certainly slowing down and I can't reinforce this enough. It's going to be very, very important to pay attention to this. If the NASDAQ stays stuck sideways in the balance range, you're really going to have this massive tug of war where potentially IWM acts as downward pressure. The Qs aren't really doing much. It's going to lead to a very choppy S&P 500. So trying to manage that intermarket dynamic, I think is really critical as small caps are threatening the weekly level and the Qs are possibly looking to stay maybe inside of the seven week balance range. If it breaks down, that's going to help the bearish pressure in the S&Ps as we trade for that larger weekly pullback.
Let's continue looking at some bearish data points here, and it doesn't just stop at the weekly performance of the S&P sectors, it goes beyond that into the actual structural charts, some specialized ratios, as well as the risk appetite. If we take a look at who's leading the pack to the downside, it's financials down 3.66%, which is fairly concerning, noting that this is now the second heaviest weighted sector by market cap. Just underneath is materials down 3.38%, and then real estate down 3.25%. Both of these are lighter weight in terms of their impact on the S&P. At the bottom end of the barrel, no surprises here, the XLK tech sector, the heaviest weight, most risk on component, is only down 56 basis points on the week. Again, no surprises because the NASDAQ is stuck sideways inside of an overall balance range. Just above is the XLP consumer staples, 1.11%, and then the XLU utilities, 1.49%. Let's check in on these structural charts, though, because this is where the rubber hits the road and the concerns start to emerge. Back here, we had a very orderly uptrend, and now we've got ourselves a breakdown. We have four aggressive days in the downward direction out of financials, leading to the loss of the 50 SMA on the daily time frame, and we could not find buyers stepping up for support at the top of the weekly breakout area from over here at $40.45. So walking forward, we need to acknowledge that the daily trend is no longer in the upward direction. There's a strong offering of continuation or a possible lower high. Early this week, any consolidation underneath $40.45, continuously rejecting that 50 SMA, I would be looking for follow through in the downward direction. And this, of course, is painful, offering downside to the S&P 500 as an index. If we do get a stronger counter trend move, it's not unreasonable to see some reprieve out of the S&Ps on a higher low over $40.45, but still understand the opportunity for a lower high to be produced on the retest of the neckline of the head and shoulders from back here. And for that reason, the structural shift out of the XLF financials, now the second heaviest weighted sector for the S&P, does not strike me as a bullish supporting piece of evidence for the S&P 500. I think we need to acknowledge these structural changes that are taking place, namely the flipping of daily uptrends into daily downtrends, perhaps. The XLB is a very lightweight sector, so we'll just take this very briefly and make the mention that we have made a new swing low underneath this previous low. Downward pressure is downward pressure, still looking for a lower high opportunity underneath $91.60. We'll change our tone if we're getting consolidation up here, but it's such a lightweight sector, we're moving on. Next up, real estate, also a lightweight sector. Notice that it's made an equal low, not a new swing lower low. If it does, that's bearish pressure for the S&Ps. If it wants to get a little bit of a rebound, oversold reaction, that's fine. It's really more neutral for the S&P. I would not read into real estate too, too much at this point in time. Here we go. XLV, what used to be the second heaviest weighted sector for the S&Ps is now the third heaviest weight sector. And what you'll notice over here is if we've actually been in a downtrend for a little bit longer, this is certainly overhead supply. Notice the rejections up against the bottom end of that overhead balance. Look at the offering of a lower high here up against the previous area of support. Look at the equal low breakdown into the end of the week and look at the equal lows back here to this bottom end of the consolidation. I certainly think it's possible that we see a counter trend move, but once again, what's happening with the trend? It's certainly shifting in the downward direction. We're well underneath the daily 50 SMA and it's been that way for a little while now. So if you're starting to sort of see where I'm going with this structurally, the underlying components of the S&P 500 are not looking as strong as they once did when everything was in a very strong uptrend. Let's move along to the XLI industrials, about 8% of the S&P. I'd be a little bit more neutral inside of this balance range. It really hasn't broken down or failed to hold on to this breakout point at 122.75 just yet. So neutral to bullish. The uptrend here is still intact, but unfortunately, it's a medium weight sector for the market. Moving along to energy, definitely a lighter weight sector, also inflationary, huge monthly breakout, large bearish engulfer on the daily. So the watch here is to see if we can get a little bit of follow through in the downward direction, but then putting your thinking cap on at 94.25, because as we know, that represents the top of the monthly bull flag. If we can get a daily retest of this level, I don't see a reason why we shouldn't be thinking about possibly continuation in the upward direction after a retest to the breakout point offering a higher low. Let's go back on down to a daily time frame chart and we'll move along to the S. MH, one of the final dominoes that, in my opinion, might fall this week, right? So if we're thinking about trends, I'd say we're fairly neutral here. There is the opportunity for this to this to act as a lower high, but we've also got from here to here to offer a higher low. So as this range resolves this week, potentially, I think we're going to have some answers for the S&P. And based on sort of what's happening here, the failure on Thursday to hold up over the midpoint of the range, the previous bottom from back over here, and the equal lows, which are all being offered at this 219.70 mark, 
I would start thinking about the opportunity for a breakdown there, putting some downward pressure on the S&P 500, one of the final dominoes to fall along with the tech sector as a whole, which we'll get to, of course. But underneath 219.70, that's where we're looking for downside. And what's the concern about 212? From a weekly point of view, is that not just a lower high double top neckline? And if we break there and start navigating towards the NVIDIA earnings gap, of course, that spells trouble for the S&P 500. So as we're thinking about bearish outcomes this week, I would certainly keep the SMH on your radar underneath 219.70. If we're going to change tone, fine. We'll be neutral through here, keeping an open mind, and we'll flip back to bullish on a higher low over 229.25. Unfortunately, based on Friday's interaction, doesn't seem like a high probability outcome that I'm betting on in the early stages of this week. Next up, XLC Communications still doing all right, more similar to industrials in my view, still holding up inside of this balance range. The trend is still up, even if we get a retest of 80, looking for a higher low and continuation in the upward direction, not the end of the world there. XLY, a little bit of a concern here, noting that the trend is certainly not up. We've got highs, equal highs, lows, drifting to a lower low, maybe equal low, really sloppy balance range. We know that Tesla itself can not get in gear, no pun intended. And if this wants to break for a lower low underneath 176.50, then of course, that's just bearish pressure for the S&P. It starts to trigger this as a bit of a head, and, uh, excuse me, not head and shoulders, but rather just double top on the daily or even weekly time frame. Any sort of move down into this 170, 175 daily 200 SMA, that puts downward pressure into the S&P 500. I'd be neutral through this balance range in here and a little bit more constructive on longs if we can get a higher low over 182. But again, think about the interaction between Thursday and Friday. We've already gone through this analysis in the S&Ps and the NASDAQ. It's a failure from the buyers and sitting on this lower low, if not just equal low, we're looking for follow through to the downside. Next up, utilities. How are we doing in the lightweight D for defensive sector? We're doing all right. We're still technically in an uptrend here with the offering of a higher low on the retest of this previous zone. But again, what did we start off with? This is a D for defensive sector. It's a very lightweight sector. It's not going to make or break the S&P 500. So this is not going to save the day, even if it does find a rebound off of this level. If we're getting continued downtrends out of financial, financials, out of the healthcare sector, if the SMH, SMH excuse me, breaks down, the XLU it doesn't matter if it's holding up over 64.25, right? So moving along to consumer staples, you'll notice that we're in a downtrend here as well. So bear flag is already playing out. We're underneath a 50 SMA. This is D for defensive. It is a lightweight sector. But remember, any pressure out of any of the sectors is somewhat going to tie back to what happens in the S&P. So even if we were like, ah, oh, you know, defensive rotation is taking place, this thing is fine, it's still in an uptrend. I mean, it's just not. Downward pressure is downward pressure. You know, there's no other way to say it other than this is a double top where underneath the neckline, this bear flag consolidation is under the neckline. It's under the 50 SMA. It's downward pressure. Again, even if you get a counter trend move here, any lower highs underneath 75, and I think you maybe flip into a weekly balance in this zone or just sustain a daily, you know, weak looking chart. Uh, that's not all that constructive for a rebound in the S&Ps. Final domino to fall. Here we go. XLK, what's going on in the tech sector? Notice the major flush point. We've already sort of beat this home. We've talked about the failure to hold up over 208. That would be the equivalent of the level we discussed in the NASDAQ QQQs. We've got equal lows. We've sort of closed underneath the 50 SMA. If this is the final one to fall, we're just looking for a move underneath 203.90 this week. This, the SMH, XLF, and XLV will all be on my screens as we're trading the early stages of this week. If we get a breakdown, if we get a move underneath 203.90, I'm thinking about follow through to the downside. Just like the QQQ, if we produce some sort of look below and fail, I will take that as a note and we will take a look at trades in the possible upward direction here towards the top of the balance. But as of right now, it's not my favorite outcome based on the analysis we've performed and everything we've seen at the internals level. Let's take a look at the ratio grid. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. This is a concern. It's underneath a downward sloping 50 SMA. Financials got absolutely decimated on the earnings release, of course, from JP Morgan. You saw the structural chart is now in a possible downtrend. XLV is trending lower here just as a heavyweight component of the S&P. Not looking great, right? XLY has not been pulling its weight for a long time now. XLI looks okay. XLC looks okay. We've identified those things. XLP is not necessarily flipping off uh, to a risk off, flipping off to a risk off uh, style look yet, but the XLU is worth acknowledging here. It's trying to find a little bit of a base and trying to get an uptrend intact. It's not glaring you to, yet to the point though, uh, where I would say, oh my goodness, run for the hills. Real estate also not much of a concern. One of the things I do want to do on today's episode is just take a look at the yearly charts here. So the tech sector has been in a downward drift for a little while now, and financials never really broke out up and over this level. Remember that financials holding before the earnings breakdown here was the one saving grace to keep us somewhat risk on, and that's no longer the case as we approach the bottom end of what could be considered just a neutral balance 
balance range at this point in time. XLY, again, for a long time now, it has not been pulling its weight as a risk on indication. Industrials do on all right. Communications do on all right. These are still in overwhelming downtrends on the higher time frames. So I, I would find it hard to say we've got like a risk off rotation underway. Oh my goodness, we're going to flip into a bear market. But it does look like, again, it's, it's certainly respectful to acknowledge the change in tone that's been taking place here. And I think that you would be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't. Here's the XLK SHY sort of at that 50 SMA. Again, if it breaks down, that's a little bit more meaningful. The better one to look at, in my view, is this XLK XLU looking for the lower high opportunity on the retest. Although it's not major, there's a little bit of a lower high. There's a downtick on Friday suggesting that, yeah, it wouldn't be unreasonable looking for this to continue in the downward direction. It's a little bit more of a risk off style sentiment. Let's take a look at the Apples to apples look here, XLY, XLP, stuck sideways in the balance range. So not really all that informative. If it breaks out, then fine. Maybe we'll change our tone to a bit more neutral in the S&Ps breaking down here. Look out below. That's just everything firing on all cylinders in the downward direction, right? In terms of risk off. Here is the SMH XLV, and this is staying sta uh, stable and sideways up and over these highs. Uh, just based on the idea that the XLV, as we just saw, is absolutely falling off of a cliff. So, of course, relative to one another, semis going sideways, this is going to move in the upward direction. So, as of right now, this appears to be risk on, but I, once again, would focus more so on the structural element out of the SMH. Let's take a look now at the dollar and see what's going on with the Dixie. Dixie is breaking out in the upward direction. So, we've seen some risk-off shifts based on these sector relationships, but now the dollar is also adding downward pressure to the market, right? As the dollar moves higher, that's technically tightening financial conditions. That doesn't spell an easy time making new highs in the S&P 500. And as of right now, if we take a look at gold, gold is pulled back a little bit, but look at where it could retrace to and still maintain the monthly breakout that it's uh, underwent so far, right? That's 2190. Not forecasting this, but again, look at what's happened here. Gold saw an aggressive pullback. If it can continue to pull back, in theory, that's alleviating downward pressure, or ex yeah, alleviating downward pressure on, on the dollar, allowing the dollar to rise, right? As gold comes down, we're thinking about the dollar possibly moving in the upward direction when it's expressed as a currency pair, right? So overall, this move to the downside is going to allow for further downward pressure actually here in the equities market itself based on that dollar relationship. And for the TNX, I believe we can cross our fingers, but I don't think it's working yet. Let's jump on over to TradingView to take a look at interest rates. So let's kick off rates with the 30-year bond yield. And you can clearly see that we're breaking out over this 4.45 inflection point. The reason I want to start with the 30-year today, and we don't often cover it, is just noting the impact on mortgage demand and new home builds and the ripple effect over to construction, of course, design and architecture. Really, this has a huge impact on the cyclical nature of the economy. So seeing this break out is not a cause for direct like, oh my goodness, panic markets are going to zero concern, but it's worth taking note of. We would in theory expect a contraction of economic output. We're not there yet. You can clearly see based on GDP uh, forecasts from the Atlanta Fed, which are very historically accurate. Uh, we've moved slightly back in the downward direction, but we're still over 2%, which is sort of that baseline Line that we're usually targeting. So Atlanta Fed still sees that growth is going to maintain on track or above track for the next quarter here. If we take a look at the 10-year yield, this of course is a little bit shorter in terms of duration. The illustration on this chart for today's episode is really understanding that this inflection point that we've broken out over over the last couple of trading sessions is the same inflection point that marked the top of the July move in the S&P 500, right? As we saw that breakdown from July into sort of late October, November, that's when the 10-year was going on its final run in the upward direction towards 5%. So we've broken out over that same inflection point, and what has the S&P 500 done? It's hardly taken a step in the downward direction. Now, I'm not saying it needs to break down and you know mirror the exact move, but it's a consideration as we're talking about all of these data points, which are flipping and leaning a little bit more bearish than bullish. Here we go with the two-year. So basically the equivalent of the inverted ZT that we look at over on Thinkorswim, undoubtedly a breakout over the top of a cup and handle formation from over here. Certainly an opportunity from a technical point of view to offer a higher low over 4.75. So if that takes place, what would that imply for the Fed funds rate? Obviously that it's got to stay higher for longer. And let's extrapolate this one time further, right? If this holds up as a bull flag and it breaks out to here up to 5.25, Again, I, you know, I certainly would be hard pressed to imagine that the Fed raises rates again, 
But over 5.25, the market is clearly sending a sign to Jerome Powell, hey, dude, you know, inflation is going to run totally out of control if you don't do something. And thankfully, the back pocket card is just saying, okay, the labor market remains incredibly robust. Let's just try to stay higher for longer as long as we possibly can. Speaking of the tracker tool, here we go. Here is the higher for longer. You can see for the June timeframe meeting, we're now at 71.7% odds. This is going to continue to flip back and forth depending on what that two year does that we were just looking at for the July meeting. As of right now, about 45, 45 split, just to use some round numbers in here on that particular metric. And the reason that this continues to be important is because it continues to offer a questioning component to the valuation of the S&P. If rates do not get cut, then was growth forecasts uh, above what they should technically be? And we'll see that on the earnings insight in just a second. But before we get there, let's do a quick recap of last week. Everybody knows that the inflation print from CPI was incredibly hot, but PPI maybe got swept a little bit underneath the rug, came in at the number and slightly underneath the number in the non-core on the month over month. And this, to me, is the primary driver, which continues to suggest that the Fed can stay higher for longer. I mean, unemployment claims, the initial jobless claims on Thursday, every morning at 830, remains incredibly resilient. It has not budged away from this sort of 210 to 220-ish zone. It's just steady week over week over week. Unless that actually spirals out of control to something like 250, I wouldn't imagine that the labor market is a major concern for uh, Jerome Powell specifically. If we take a look at inflation expectations, these came out on the Friday sort of mid-morning session. 3.1 was certainly a miss from 2.9. So are inflation expectations becoming entrenched? That's an issue that makes it harder for inflation to actually make it down towards target at 2%. You want to see expectations be an actual driver of how inflation comes in. If we take a look at the PPI read from the, uh, what was it, Thursday session, you'll note here that services remains basically unchanged. We saw some goods deflation in terms of PPI. Uh, excuse me, this is energy. Uh, so energy, volatile food and energy, as they classically say, right? So underneath, um, a little bit of energy def deflation, but the sticky side, which is services in blue here, basically unchanged on a month over month read. So I wouldn't really be holding my breath too, too much for the next following PCE read where, you know, maybe we let out a sigh of relief. It's still looking like inflation has found a bit of a floor at that 3% mark, even with this on, on par with expectation or maybe beating expectations PPI report. It's not, it's, it's not the type of report that you would like to see. You'd like to see services actually flat or maybe even negative to combat some of the things that we were dealing with, with CPI, right? Let's move into earnings. Now, one of the takeaways here is just the revisions in the downward direction. If you take a look at what's happening, over here. Uh, four sectors are reporting lower earnings today. So as we were talking about on the Fed tracker tool, the questioning of the valuation of the S&P 500, this is going to be a top of mind conversation. Now, as we know, earnings have barely just begun. 6% of the S&P 500 companies have actually reported. As we move into the coming week's worth of trade, we're going to get a lot of information coming at us hot and heavy. The banks finish up, at least the important ones, as uh, as Monday opens up. You can see Goldman and Charles Schwab up there. As And, you know, we'll give, we'll, we'll say Bank of America, the old guard, if you will, is still up there as well. So Tuesday before the open is Bank of America. Uh, Morgan Stanley as well. That one sort of slipped me by. I didn't even see that one. But anyways, as we move forward towards the end of the week, though, this is where the rubber starts to hit the road with Netflix, with your TSMC in terms of first look at chip production, right? This is where I would say we're really going to buckle down for earnings season and start to dive into that report to determine whether or not expectations walking forward need to be revisited and sort of adjusted to the downside based on the Fed's new stance, or at least the tracker tool in the market pricing in, higher for longer. Taking a look at some risk appetite charts, you'll notice that the TLT ratio to the S&P 500 saw a minor uptick on the Friday session. We'll continue to keep an eye on that to see if it continues in the upward direction, suggesting a flight to safety. But as of right now, not the end of the world. If we take a look at bonds in relationship to themselves, we'll certainly make note and continue to point out that we are printing higher highs here, which just is in reference to people favoring the shorter end of the curve, which of course would imply a reduced appetite for risk on a longer time horizon, speaks to a little bit of uncertainty here, which ties into the overall narrative that there are some changes taking place in this market. Let's take a look at credit spreads. I cannot ignore this one anymore. I've tried to sort of keep it like, okay, we're still low. We're near that 50 SMA, but it's worth pointing out that the credit spreads in the short duration HYG SHY relationship are offering a higher low as well with now with highs 
higher highs, and we actually printed some higher highs into the end of this week. It's not the end of the world. It's not, oh my goodness, duck and cover. We're going to have a credit event, but it's worth keeping an eye on. This potential reversal of the trend here near these lows, you know, just something to continue to monitor here. If it continues to accelerate in the upward direction, obviously that spells downward pressure for markets over here. What about the HYG in isolation? This again really captures my attention and it needs to be discussed. We've broken down underneath this very major area of support at 76.60. We've been watching this area for a very long time. I never actually put in the equivalent low here on the S&Ps. And again, the call is not to say that the S&P 500 needs to break down underneath 4,700. That's not the idea. We're talking about directional vectors. As long as the HYG is underneath 7660, in theory, that's putting downward pressure on a relative basis for the market. Or it's just rather just suggesting, hey, risk appetite is suppressed here. People are taking it easy. People are taking their foot off the gas pedal and not taking risk in junk bonds, basically. If we move along to the digital gold, what's happening in BTC? Going sideways, a little bit of a breakdown on that Friday session. There was some panic there, but I mean, give yourself a 90,000 foot view. Still very much so a bull flag. As long as we're consolidating up here, looking for that follow through, remember that this bull flag actually broke, reversed, and then ripped back in the upward direction. So don't jump chip on, on saying like, oh my goodness, Bitcoin's going to zero. It's just one day of breakdown. Uh, and we're still very much so in that consolidation. Moving along to new highs versus lows. So we've got to have a conversation about breath because it's certainly contracting. Look at this sharp move back down to the zero line. And if you actually take a look at a daily time frame chart, we were actually negative into the close of the week here without very much of a rebound on that Thursday session where we saw the short squeeze. So as breath is contracting, as sectors are breaking down, as HYG and risk appetite is maybe being reduced just a little bit, you know, throw in breath there. And I, you know, I, I think it's very reasonable that the market could basically pull back. Um, and, you know, we'll see if anybody gets overly defensive in the comments section. I'll just clearly know they didn't make it to this point in the video. Here's the SPX A200R breaking down a little bit, still over the 50% mark. But if we take a look at the SPX A50R, oh my goodness, we've slipped 50% on a very aggressive move in the downward direction. So once again, is breath contracting beyond the point of what we'd like to see? Well, certainly underneath the 50% mark. Let's take a look at the RSP equal weight S&P 500, obviously a more severe lower low on the breakdown, suggesting that as long as we produce a lower high underneath, we're looking for downward pressure in the marketplace itself. QQQE, what's going on over here? Same concept. Notice the breakdown of these lows, right? Whereas in the QQQ weighted, the NDX technically up here, did not make that low. It's still holding up over the 50 SMA as we explored in the QQQ. So seeing this breakdown, again, I, you know, when I'm just gathering up all the data points. It's not because I want markets to go to zero. Trust me, I have a long-term vested interest in markets going higher. You know, the data points are just becoming too hard to ignore, basically. Dow Jones Industrial coming into a major retest above and still inside of the balance over here. So trying to give this the benefit of the doubt, can we find support over 37.777? Magic sevens strike once again. Let's move on over into some volatility looks because this also starts to become somewhat concerning. Look at the VIX spiking aggressively up and over 15 on that Friday session as we're breaking down and staying, you know, fairly weak into the close there. So VIX over 15 paired with, if we take a look at the VVIX, wrong menu, my apologies. Look at this closing right at 103. This is the sort of no go go zone where it's time to put the big boy pants on. This is certainly an indication. Notice what happened on October, right? When the breakdown started to take place. Here is August when the market topped out, right? So as we start getting prints up around this 103 out of the VVIX, it's worth understanding that this has more severe implications for the market. This is not just, ah, oh, no, it's just a mild pullback. No, this could certainly turn into something more with volatility poised the way that it currently is. Let's move into the final volatility indication, which is the VIX futures moving closer to a backwardation. We're still technically in contango underneath the zero mark, nine versus 30 day VIX, still technically underneath the zero mark, but looking to see if these follow through in the upward direction, that would be concerning. The largest tell is actually down here in the one day VIX. One of the things I was thinking about into the end of the week, if things were going to be fine and dandy, was looking for that oh so elusive red day out of the one day VIX. Maybe we broke down there. It's a free money Friday, whatever people like to call it is the exact opposite. We rotated back in the upward direction directly to the highs of the overall range. As a matter of fact, this is some of the highest VIX one day reads that we've seen in a very long time. So if we do see a little bit of a wick here, you know, historically, based on the data we have in all of the trading history, we have not seen prints that, that really sustain up and over that level, but I'm very curious to see how this resolves early on this week. Do we open on a gap down and you know move it higher? Do we open up here still over that 1275? I think volatility is worth paying attention to. And once again, what are hallmark signs of an uncertain market, a bear market, higher and heightened volatility? We're certainly getting that. So is it fair to say that everything's fine and dandy out there in the S&P 500? Shut up, Matt, and buy the dip. I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced, basically, based on all the data points we've covered in today's episode. 
If you've made it to this point in the analysis, I'm sure you're enjoying the show. Do me a favor and hit the subscribe button for 100K by May, and we'll kick off the core list of companies here with none other than Apple on the daily time frame chart. My goodness, we're talking about bearish activity over here in the S&P 500. And look at Apple, the complete outlier in the upward direction, absolutely ripping to the upside on Thursday and even getting some follow through on Friday. The one interesting thing is the larger upper wick rejecting the daily 50 SMA. This is a very aggressive counter trend move. We have a buyer's sort of in control control pattern here, taking back a number of weeks of downside pressure from in this box and closing firmly on Friday near those weekly highs with just a little bit of an upper wick. So we've got to give credit where credit is due. Buyers are trying to make a stand. So the larger time frame patterns would suggest if we can clear these highs, maybe it's a daily double bottom and we look for a larger reversal out of Apple. If we consolidate in here, it turns into a bull flag and we look for that follow through in the upward direction as well. One of the major inflection points that you cannot ignore is this flush point from over here at 180.25. That's a very, very important target if the market continues higher here out of Apple into the coming week's worth of trade. If we slip underneath this 173.75, so if bull flag consolidation does not happen here, I would promptly change my tone back in the downward direction and look for a drift towards these equal lows around 169. Here it is on the hourly time frame chart, just so you can see that this consolidation, I mean, there's a lot of range in there. So be open-minded to potentially playing longs off of this area, shorts off of this area, if it's you know something that does this first. There's a lot of range. So 177, 173, 75, this is a very you know emotional move in the upward direction, news-driven, of course. And now we're getting some early signs of digestion holding up through the move. So I tend to lean a little bit more bullish at face value, but not too afraid to change my bias back to down on any lower highs underneath 173.75. Next up, Microsoft. What's going on with Softy? Could not hold the 423. I mean, we did for a day, which was awesome. Uh, but this back down underneath leads me to believe that we just have this huge balance area. Look above and fail has played out. We've hit the bottom end of the range. Now we're looking for the next trade. Notice that on Friday, we've technically closed closer to the midpoint of the overall balance. I'd keep an open mind looking for, you know, something to happen first. Get me here, get me here, and then we'll make some decisions. And I would really like to see whatever the broad market is doing, I'll tend to trade in alignment of that. So let's just say that everything's weak, right? That really leaves two outcomes. Looking for bearish consolidation and breakdowns out of Microsoft, great, will trade downside. If Microsoft is the sort of unicorn and it wants to rally amid a weak, broad market, I would just wait patiently for shorts up against known areas of resistance, in this case, 426.75. So balance rules are in force out of Microsoft, and you can look for your upper and lower levels. Next up, Goog L, beautiful chart in my view. Uh, you know, what we're looking for here, here's the daily chart, because I think that this actually makes it a little bit easier to kind of understand. Uh, you know, as long as we're over this level, this is bullish consolidation, this is bullish balance. So you would want to be as long as, or not as long as possible, but as, as close as possible on the long side to this area right here. Because if you drift underneath, great, you stop out of the position, you get out of the way, maybe there's a deeper pullback. If this is the pullback, and here it is back on the hourly time frame chart, Look at what we have. I mean, if we can support off of this structural element here, here, and here, if we can find buyers around this 156.85, looking to trade that in the upward direction. Now, sure, we did technically breach that Thursday high and completely reject on Friday, but the trend here is more firmly in the upward direction compared to what we had out of, say, Microsoft or even Apple. Now, granted, Apple had its little route to the upside, but uh, Microsoft's more balanced, right? So to me, this higher low phenomenon is looking to continue here on a hold of 156.85, looking for blue sky territories on a break of this high around 159.50. Next up, we've got Amazon. What's going on with Nancy? She's breaking down after making a new all-time high and unfortunately not in a respectful way. I mean, there is an opportunity for a higher low to be found here, but ideally this consolidation, this pullback would have happened over the breakout point here at 187.25. So for that reason, a little bit more neutral in the midpoint of this range right here. If we get rejections, and again, this really depends on broad market context. If the broad market's bearish and this rallies, we'll look for a lower high here, one and two, then we'll trade it back down into this, which would emerge as a neckline. And then maybe there's a stronger reversal. If the market's strong, show me the consolidation here. We'll try to get longs on the retest after retesting and breaking out over 187.25. Next up, we've got NVIDIA. What's going on with NIVDA, the one stock to rule them all. Here it is, stronger move on Thursday than I would have ever imagined because of the hourly downtrend channel over here, but we've got to take it at face value. So 
If we're looking at the chart objectively, I would start to envision how this has the opportunity to offer a higher low over the bottom of the previous balance from back here. That level is at 871.50. So NVIDIA, if you can hold up over 871.50, if you can show us the long opportunities here and rotate back up to these equal highs, if not the top of the balance, I will concede that, okay, maybe the one stock to rule them all is going to exist sideways in this range and possibly go for another run in the upward direction. NVIDIA, if you do not show me the higher low over 871.50, I am shorting you underneath Eight, uh, 865.50. If we can get this as a thin structure retracement, I'm all over it. Not only is it a lower high, not only is it a failure back down underneath the major balance lows, if this happens, you have everybody here who's trapped long looking for the thin structure retracement. So that's my take on NVIDIA. You've got 871.50 and 865.50 play among those levels. And I think that uh, you'll be led probably in the right direction, depending on price action itself. If we're over, trying to avoid the short. If we're under, looking for the short, or at least avoiding the long. Next up, we've got AMD. So speaking of chips and semiconductors, what do we see? Here's a balance range. Here was our break. Here is a balance range. And here is our break, looking for consecutive lower highs to sustain underneath 164.60 on the daily time frame chart. That, as we know, is a breakdown of the major head and shoulders formation. Here is your neckline. Friday is completely underneath. This is a textbook, bear flag formation, looking for that follow through. Once again, lower highs on the hourly below 164.60, trading in the downward direction. First target 158.50 and then 150.35. This as a weekly breakout point. If the buyers are going to make something happen here, it's really two opportunities. Number one is a micro look below and fail. So here is a balance range. Show me the look below and fail early in the week, higher low over 164.60. I might change my tone. The next place is really on a higher low, which I, I get it. It's a stretch, but something up here and I will change my tone over 183.25, changing the daily trend and reversing the opportunity for a bear flag breakdown. Next up, we've got Metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's Fantasyland? It looks like he's tearing another ACL, possibly. Uh, that's kind of a joke based on the price action, uh, but we're moving in the downward direction, right? So, Ideally, I would have loved to see this 510.75 higher low hold. We were sort of looking for that outcome here in the upward direction. But again, taking the chart at face value, it's very difficult to ignore that this is a possible lower high. These are equal lows. Maybe this is a lower high double top. Uh, breaking down underneath this neckline, I would have to change my tone a little bit, looking for some downside, looking for some scalps, at least in the downward direction. So shorts underneath 510.75 trade into this level right here. The thin structure breakdown, the more attractive breakdown in my view, is just looking for that, right? That would almost be the equivalent of that NVIDIA trade we were just discussing underneath its flag consolidation. So that level is 504. There's your thin structure. Here's the retest level at 494.25. Next up, we've got Tesla. What's going on with Mr. Musk and his car that can't get in gear. That's what we're going to call it from now on. It's a very loose looking chart. We've made this comment a number of times in the pre-market prep, just very, you know, little up, little down, little up, little down, no real follow through out of the chart, really more so a sideways balance inside of this as an overall range. So we're quite literally in the midpoint of that range. And you know what they say in the midpoint of range, just don't do it, right? So in my view, longs look good over 176.75. We'll test the top and see if we can get some follow through. If we're just chopping around in here, again, don't do it. Not really too fond of, uh, of trading Tesla. If we can slip this with a lower high, it's the exact opposite. So it's really just balance rules in play at uh, extending the upper bound a little bit to 176.75. And the lower bound here is at least a trade. You'd be a little bit more constructive on larger downside underneath 163.75. Next up, last but not least for the broad market, then I've got three trade ideas for you. You've got Netflix. Netflix is interesting. Uh, let's Let's take this actually out to a daily time frame chart. I mean, the daily is not horrible. It's really not horrible. It's just been putting in this very slow grind in the upward direction. Earnings are this week. So keep that in mind if you're an options trader, right? But this breakout level, just, it can't seem to can't seem to materialize. So we know that we've been calling this the heartbreaker trade recently. It's down, it's up, it's down, it's up. It's just volatile in my view. So for those reasons, I would keep it simple out of Netflix. If before earnings, we can get a massive breakout, oops, let's just go back to the daily chart actually. If we can get a massive breakout up and over that 633.50 with higher low retests intraday above, that's what I was gonna try to illustrate on the hourly. If we can get that, then awesome, we'll take the trade. If we're just chopping around in this ahead of earnings, I think that this is a hard pass for the coming week. And with that said, let's take a look at these additional ideas. Thank <laughs> you. 
So here we go, CVX, Chevron is up first on the chopping block, and there's actually a lot of trades that look similar to this, and I'm sure you can tell based on the energy sector what we're thinking about. A little bit of engulfing action into the end of this week, looking for some follow through to retest the breakout point in here. If we can hold up over 156.75, looking for buyers to step up and trade this back in the upward direction to the equal highs, if not follow through beyond that. Uh, at least as a scalp, this is one of the more liquid names, CVX here. XOM is another good one, so ExxonMobil, of course, there's a bit more room to fall in the downward direction out of Exxon. You can see that the retest level would be a bit further down at 115. Again, the options on this one trade pretty decently. This is, you know, maybe a little bit of something at the Friday low, but with the bearish nature of the engulfing bar, sort of looking for a bit deeper of a pullback. Again, as long as that's over 115, that's a possible idea for you. Another one that comes to mind is like PSX. So Phillips, right? You can see the same thing happening here. Retest over that at a little bit of a different price point. Um, another one, let's go VLO. I think that's going to be the cheapest of the ones that, oh, I guess not. Uh, uh, Valero, <laughs> not even uh, one of the cheaper ones that come to mind here. Uh, Oxy is fairly cheap, but let's first start with Marathon, MPC, Marathon Petroleum. Um, a 200. So, you know, all the names that come to mind are the more expensive sort of options traders, right? So these are all names with a lot of similar setups. Oxy, let's try it out, see if Oxy uh, is suggesting a similar setup at a smaller price point. I suppose a little bit, right? So if we can break down through the bottom end of this range, maybe that's the trade for you uh, out of Oxy getting here and then looking for that retracement back in the upward direction, trying to align with the prevailing winds here, which are certainly an overall uptrend, looking for the pullback from the highest high in the cycle. Next up, we've got Nike. NKE is a continuation play of sort of the bearish idea we had back down over here, where we're looking for a flush underneath 88.75. If this lower high was going to stick, it would have been great for some follow through in the downward direction, but I'm still open-minded to this idea, staying underneath this as overhead supply. If the market's going to remain weak, there's an opportunity for this to just act as a lower high, equal low reattempts. And as we know, there's a real large breakdown zone underneath into 83.15. So still keeping this one on the radar, but maybe perhaps not as actionable uh, unless you're looking for maybe a scalp underneath 91 lower high gets you to the equal though that's possible other than that it's sort of patience and again underneath 88.75 is interesting in the downward direction next up we've got wfc obviously on the heels of earnings here but notice out of wells fargo and this is maybe a bit counter to the point that we were making in the xlf as a sector itself Notice that we opened weak underneath this big shelf of possible support, right? And then we looked under the previous day's low, so the hammer candle low. We made a new low, but we also made an equal high and closed ever so slightly, ever so slightly. It's a very, very big nuance here. We closed over 56.35, which was the opening print of this green bar from back here. So it's not just like arbitrary, oh my goodness, he's picking a low and it looks like it closes over above. It's the opening print of that green bar. So the fact that we've closed above that ignition bar in the upward direction, the opening print of it, in my view, is this possibly a look below and fail? It's something I'm considering into the coming week's worth of trade. And if Wells Fargo can hold up here around 56.35, the top end of the balance is the target at 58. So, you know, if we need a counter trend move out of the XLF as a sector, the, you know, Wells Fargo as an individual component could be an actual trade to look for a move in the upward direction. That's all I've got for you in today's episode of the weekly watch list. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything new, let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a very simple thumbs up. Remember, 100K by May. We're about halfway through April. We're not yet at 90K subs. We start the month at around 80. We've got to pick up the pace here. So send it to someone you know, make sure you're subscribed and we'll get the gold done. Uh, we will be live on Monday morning. There is going to be retail sales released. So of course, keep an eye out for that. Coffee and donuts on me up in the penthouse suites, 815 live here on the channel, free and open to the public. We hope to see you there and I wish you a green trading week.